Tonight, an autopsy reveals new details in the tragic death of actor Matthew Perry. If used inappropriately and if used at inappropriately high doses, it can be dangerous. Perry died from the acute effects of the drug ketamine, what it's typically used for. Israel's military says it killed three hostages in Gaza by mistake. <laughs> Anger on the streets of Tel Aviv and in Gaza. Shocking violence in Canadian stores. Employees attack, some with weapons. A person will again turn around, physically punch them, threaten them with a knife. That's insane in this day and age. We break down what's fueling the violence. This is The National with Ian Hennemanse. Nearly two months after the sudden and shocking death of actor Matthew Perry, we're learning why he died. An autopsy report made public late today says acute effects from the drug ketamine are to blame. A medical examiner in Los Angeles found levels of ketamine in Perry's body were in the range used for general anesthetic. The actor was found dead in a hot tub at his home in late October. Fans and friends were stunned by his death. Perry, who grew up in Canada, spoke openly about his decades-long battle with addiction and his desire to help others. Ithil Musa looks at what his autopsy found and the questions that still remain. Matthew Perry was candid with his struggles. Now his tragic death has been ruled accidental. The Friends actor was found dead at his Los Angeles home in late October. According to the coroner's report, Perry's assistant found him floating face down in the heated end of his pool and called 911. The report says his death was the result of the acute effects of ketamine, a powerful anesthetic. It also names drowning, coronary artery disease, and buprenorphine, a medication used to treat opioid addiction as contributing factors. The levels in the blood were very high. At those levels, this drug can be very sedating. It can slow down your breathing. It can reduce your level of consciousness to the point where you really become drowsy and, and essentially you lose consciousness. If that happens when you're in, in a tub, you know, it's very easy to then drown. Perry's autopsy report says the actor had reportedly been clean for 19 months. He had been receiving ketamine infusions to treat depression and anxiety as recently as a week and a half before his death. But the report notes the ketamine in his system could not have been from that therapy session. What was uh, uh, inappropriate in this case was, uh, or potentially inappropriate in this case, is the um, uh, additional doses of ketamine or the use of ketamine uh, outside of what may have been prescribed or doses that may have been prescribed. Perry had battled a decades-long addiction to alcohol and opiates, which he detailed in his memoir released last year. I'm a pretty strong, resilient guy, but it has nothing to do with weakness. It's a disease that we have, and we don't know that we have it. And if somebody says, just stop, you know, you want to punch him in the face. Perry, who was raised in Ottawa, was 54 years old. Idil Musa, CBC News, Toronto. The death of a young boy near Montreal has shocked his hockey community. The 11-year-old was hit in the neck by a puck. As Alison Northcott explains, it's believed he was wearing all of the required safety gear. Outside the arena in saint Eustache, Quebec, expressions of grief and condolences after the death of an 11-year-old hockey player. We wanted to give him a get well bouquet, says Mylène Larose. Then today we learned the news. Police say the young player was hit in the neck by a puck during his hockey practice on Tuesday. He was rushed to hospital but later died. We're all uh, together uh, in this, uh, we're all sad about this news. This player and his dad shaken by the news. Everybody's talking about it at the arena here. Um, it's like I said, it's something that we never want to happen to any kid. Hockey Quebec says it believes the boy was wearing all the mandatory equipment, which includes a net guard. We're trying to, to have the best equipment possible to play that sports. Unfortunately, sometimes the, it's an accident and uh, we don't know. Uh, what to do with that, but uh, it's really bad. We, we, it's really scaring for the parents and the, 
the kids too. And Adam Johnson back for Aston. This comes after another deadly on ice incident earlier this fall when player Adam Johnson died in the UK after his neck was cut by an opponent's skate during a game. In St. Eustache, where many had hoped the young player would recover, people are now mourning his loss. It's so sad, says Benoit Giroir. I have an 11 year old too. In a statement, the St. Eustache Minor Hockey Association says the incident has shaken the organization and that it's working to support the player's teammates. Police have called this an accident. Quebec's coroner's office says it will investigate to determine the cause of the boy's death and the circumstances around it. Alison Northcott, CBC News, St. Eustache. A 25-year-old Toronto woman has been charged with first-degree murder in the deaths of her two young sons. Police say the woman jumped from the sixth floor of this apartment building on Sunday. She was taken to hospital with serious but non-life-threatening injuries. Inside the apartment, they found her sons, aged five and four, unconscious. They were pronounced dead in hospital. <laughs> Turning to the Middle East, and a stunning announcement from the Israeli military. The IDF says it accidentally killed three of the very hostages it was trying to save. The admission sparking angry protest inside Israel and growing concern in Washington about the intensity of the war. Sasha Petrasik explains. Amid the fierce fighting of Gaza City, gun battles between Israeli forces and Hamas militants, a deadly turn for three Israeli hostages out alone. Our soldiers saw them as a threat, says an Israeli military spokesman. They killed them. Three men, all in their 20s, taken by Hamas from communities near the Gaza border on October 7th. It's not clear if they escaped or were abandoned by their captors. Their civilian clothes offered no protection. We're fighting in a civilian environment where almost all of the RPG crews and the uh, uh, IED crews that have been attacking our tanks and our troops have been dressed in civilian clothes. Uh, so it creates a very dynamic and challenging combat environment. After the news, protesters ramped up the pressure on a government already feeling it, demanding freedom for more than 100 remaining hostages. Not one has been rescued through Israel's offensive. Palestinian casualties also mounted as relentless airstrikes continued. Powerful bombs all night, this injured woman says while we prayed. Meanwhile, more aid is getting through. Israel says it's opening a second crossing for trucks to enter Gaza from southern Israel, which should allow it to meet a commitment to let in 200 shipments a day. But Israel is feeling the squeeze. From Hamas, as its rockets were shot down over Jerusalem, even from allies in Washington, who sent top advisor Jake Sullivan to tell Israel the intensity of fighting should diminish soon. We will continue to reiterate both publicly and privately our commitment to the notion that every innocent life should be sacred and should be protected. On a day with grieving on both sides. Sasha Petrasik, CBC News, Toronto. Three alleged Hamas members appeared before German court today after being arrested for plotting to attack Jewish sites in Europe. German prosecutors say the three suspects were arrested in Berlin, where it's believed they intended to store weapons. A fourth was picked up by Dutch police in Rotterdam after German authorities tipped them off. Hungary is blocking an EU aid package to Ukraine worth billions of dollars. As Breyer Stewart tells us, it's the latest financial sting for a country staring down another winter of war with Russia. The 27 EU members don't all agree when it comes to Ukraine, but most vow their differences can be put aside. Hungary's Viktor Orban is the outlier, literally. He was advised to step out of the room when the bloc voted to approve formal EU membership talks with Ukraine. Aber es kann nicht jedes Mal durch, uh, Things can't be solved every time by going outside, said Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz. That's reserved for special moments, such as the decision we reach now. No. Orban, who has strong ties to Vladimir Putin, didn't veto that move, but says he might in the future. 
Magyarország lelkismeretét nem terheli. If the EU doesn't unfreeze funds being withheld from Hungary over concerns about the country's rule of law. As for now, he says he will block an EU deal to provide Ukraine with 50 billion euros. So those discussions have been postponed to the new year. I'm extremely confident and optimistic that uh, we will be in a position to fulfill on our promises to support Ukraine. President Zelensky, are you confident you can persuade Congress to give you the aid? The holdup of EU aid follows the debate in Washington earlier this week, where Republicans have blocked more U.S. support for Ukraine, despite personal pleas from both the Ukrainian and U.S. presidents. I believe Ukraine will get the money that the EU has promised it. But this political expert says the bigger problem will be if the U.S. doesn't reach an agreement. There is uh, undoubtedly many types of ammunition and other uh, military aid that only the United States can provide. And that is what Ukraine says it desperately needs as it tries to seize momentum on the battlefield in a war that Ukraine's top general now describes as a stalemate. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Former Trump attorney Rudy Giuliani has been ordered to pay almost $150 million to two Georgia election workers. Giuliani falsely claimed the mother and daughter helped steal the 2020 election, unleashing a torrent of abuse from Trump supporters. Chris Reyes has the reaction tonight. I am Lady Ruby. Today's a good day. It's the kind of statement Ruby Freeman hasn't been able to make in years, not since this moment, when a video showing her and her daughter Shay Moss simply doing their jobs as election workers in Fulton County, Georgia, was used by Rudy Giuliani and others to spread lies that they helped cheat the 2020 presidential election. They look like this. They look like they're passing out dope, not just ballots. Uh, it is quite clear they're stealing votes. Years of online abuse and harassment followed, Giuliani never backing down from his accusations, despite zero evidence. Freeman and Moss sued him for defamation and won. A jury in Washington, D.C. ordered Giuliani to pay the mother-daughter $148 million in damages. The flame that Giuliani lit with those lies and passed to so many others to keep that flame blazing changed every aspect of our lives. Money will never solve all of my problems. I can never move back into the house that I called home. Giuliani was supposed to testify but never took the stand. After the verdict, he called the amount absurd and said he will appeal. I have no doubt, I have no doubt that my comments were made and they were supportable and are supportable today. I just did not have an opportunity to present the evidence that we offered. The staggering amount is more than three times what the women's lawyers asked for and comes after the jury listened to powerful testimonies from Freeman and Moss who detailed the vile and racist harassment against them, like this voicemail message played in court. It is fairly clear at this point that Rudy Giuliani doesn't have the money, but at the same time, this is a strong signal. Moss and Freeman's legal teams say their quest for justice isn't over. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. The House of Commons has now begun its winter break, but before it did, Speaker Greg Fergus apologized again to MPs for filming a video message played at a partisan event. I should have never recorded that video. Not in the Speaker's uniform, not in the Speaker's office, and not for a friend who is an active politician. I am deeply sorry. Speakers are supposed to be impartial and nonpartisan. In a report issued yesterday, a House committee called for him to make this apology and pay a fine, but not lose his job. These paintings have fooled some of the best, purported to be by the founder of the Group of Seven. The Vancouver Art Gallery now knows they are fakes. A team has been investigating them for years, the paintings arriving at the gallery with an intriguing story about being buried decades ago for safekeeping. Belpuri shows us the telltale signs that investigators eventually spotted. 
The sketches were trumpeted as the most significant historical donation ever received by the Vancouver Art Gallery, but it wasn't long before art experts started to ask questions. They noticed a lot of things immediately about discrepancies between the, the size of the panel, the thickness of the panel. The 10 oil sketches were thought to be by Group of Seven painter J.E.H. MacDonald. The group includes iconic landscape painters active in the 1920s and 1930s. In 2015, the sketches were billed as newly discovered and never before displayed. There were several red flags raised about the artwork. Some of the concerns were about the brush strokes. Some of the concerns were about the color palette and techniques generally used in the sketches. For instance, experts say McDonald never included people in his initial sketches. He would go out in the landscape, paint the landscape, and then he would make alterations to the work, add figures, do other things, make changes. And um, the artist who made this was obviously not aware of that. The gallery was told the paintings were buried for decades in the artist's backyard. In the 70s, they were reportedly dug up and bought by a family friend whose sons, another 40 years later, found the work stashed in a basement. Ultimately, it was the Federal Heritage Agency that discovered the truth. In microscopic bits of paint, it found colors not even available during McDonald's lifetime. We didn't have to look in detail into McDonald's mixtures and pigments because the result was so clear at the outset that he couldn't have used those pigments. The gallery has now turned that investigation into an exhibition. The important thing is that we're transparent and human and, um, and th that we move forward uh, in an authentic way. And I'm not embarrassed of that. I'm, I'm very proud of this exhibition. The fake sketches are on display, attributed to an unknown painter. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. The federal government revealed today how much news organizations will be paid as part of its deal with Google. It's a great day for the sustainability of our newsrooms. Google will pay a total of $100 million through the Online News Act, which becomes law next week. Of that, broadcasters will receive no more than 30%. CBC Radio Canada will get up to 7%. The remainder will be split between print and digital media outlets. Prince Harry won a big legal victory today against a tabloid newspaper in the UK. I hope that the court's findings will serve as a warning to all media organizations. The damages awarded in the phone hacking scandal and what could come next. Plus, stores under threat from violence and vandalism. I never thought in all my years that I would have to be looking at purchasing stab vests. What's behind the rising tide of attacks? And later, an Edmonton apartment transformed by holiday spirit. It's my dream. It's my ultimate dream. The Christmas collection that just kept growing. We're back in two. Alex Batty has been found safe and well. It's been six years since his disappearance. A mystery that long stumped British police has ended. 11-year-old Alex Batty was traveling in Spain with his mother and grandfather back in 2017 when he disappeared. The case went cold for years, but this week, a French delivery driver found Batty walking along a road in southwestern France. And he told me that he, that he was kidnapped by, by his mother and grandfather. He told me that he was in spiritual community. Batty, now 17, said he'd escaped that spiritual community in the Pyrenees Mountains. Police were notified, as was Batty's grandmother, who is his legal guardian. Said to be in good health, Batty should soon be on his way home to the UK. Prince Harry is declaring victory tonight after a London judge ruled he was a victim of phone hacking. Thomas Dagla has more on the ruling and why the prince's battle with the British tabloids may not be over. A British court has found sensational tabloid headlines like these about Prince Harry's drug use, love life and army service stemmed from illegal means like phone hacking. For Harry, it's a big win in his lawsuit against the publisher of London's Daily Mirror. He wasn't there to hear the court's ruling in person, but had his lawyer deliver something of a victory speech on his behalf. 
I hope that the court's findings will serve as a warning to all media organisations who have employed these practices and then similarly lied about them. Earlier this year, Harry appeared in the witness box, giving rare testimony from a son of the king. He's long accused the tabloids of unscrupulous tactics, and among the 33 articles reviewed in court, nearly half were found to be the product of unlawful information gathering. The judge wrote at the Mirror phone hacking started in 1996 and later became widespread and habitual. The court awarding Harry damages worth roughly $240,000. I think he wants to prove that he hasn't just been moaning about his invasion of privacy by the media. This is a, a, a pretty good outcome for Harry. The court also found former tabloid editor turned broadcaster Piers Morgan knew full well about voicemail interception. He responded defiant as ever. I've never hacked a phone or told anybody else to hack a phone. And nobody has produced any actual evidence to prove that I did. In his memoir, Harry recalled a conversation he says he had with his father, King Charles, and his brother, Prince William, suggesting they didn't support his fight. But they were keen to know how my lawsuit was going, because that directly affected them. Still ongoing, I said. Suicide mission, Pa mumbled. Maybe, but it's worth it. Harry's battle with the tabloids is hardly over. He's now calling on police to lay criminal charges. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Starting today, menstrual products must be made available for free to all employees in federally regulated workplaces. We have to look at menstrual products as a necessity item, just like toilet paper. Why it's being hailed as a big step forward for equity in the workplace. Plus rising incidents of violent thefts on retail stores. The violence against service workers in Canada has reached a crisis point. Looking for solutions to a complex problem. We have to take a long-term approach to this. The National breaks down the stories shaping our world. Next. A sixth person in Canada has now died linked to the outbreak of salmonella in cantaloupes. The Public Health Agency of Canada says 53 people have been hospitalized. Many of those getting sick are young children or older adults. Malachita and Rudy brand cantaloupes have both been recalled. As of today, federally regulated employers are required to provide free menstrual products in washrooms. Nicole Williams shows us why advocates hope this is just the beginning. For Rachel Ettinger, this has been a long time coming. Everyone who menstruates should be able to menstruate with dignity. She started a petition three years ago, calling for period products to be available at work. It was eventually presented in the House of Commons. It's the same as toilet paper, so they should be provided in washrooms. It's now law that period products be available for free in all employee washrooms at workplaces, including government offices, crown corporations, banks and airports. Every stall also needs a disposal container, the new equipment covered by the employer. You can't, for lack of a better word, expel people who menstruate off of the premises of a, of a workplace in order to go and meet their, their basic needs. Some critics question why the law mandates period products be available in men's washrooms too. Not everyone who identifies as a woman menstruates, okay? So we also trans men menstruate, non-binary individuals menstruate. The new measures were announced seven months ago, but product distributors say not all workplaces have complied. Canada's Labour Minister says it's going to take time. I think most workplaces, most employers and employees are going to, uh, you know, grasp this uh, and welcome it. Still, advocates are hopeful this is just the start. They want to see free period products in all schools and private businesses. If we want all workspaces across the country to provide free menstrual products, it starts with our federally regulated workspaces. The federal government says if a workplace has yet to provide period products, workers can file a complaint. Nicole Williams, CBC News, Ottawa. Now we break down a story shaping our world, a rise in damage and danger where Canadians shop. It's the level of violence. Retail is reeling. <coughs> Stores vandalized. This window out here isn't smashed. This one's been smashed. That one's been smashed. 
Workers attacked. Punch them, threaten them with a knife, hit them with an object, stab them with a needle. And easy solutions may be out of reach. In a few minutes, we'll talk causes and solutions, but first, some BC retailers took us inside their stores to show us the violence that has them sounding the alarm. A brazen robbery caught on a security camera inside a London drugstore. A woman threatening staff, demanding a new mobile phone. Take a closer look. She's brandishing a cleaver that she took from the kitchen aisle. At another location in Vancouver, a disagreement turns dangerous. Cameras show an attacker chasing a man with a large knife. These are some of the videos London Drugs is sharing with CBC. They show distressing and even violent moments inside its stores across Western Canada. What we see that really concerns us is the level of violence in particular. This is a people issue. Clint Malman is the company's chief operating officer. The violence against service workers in Canada has reached a crisis point, and we need politicians to recognize that they're behind the issue on this. Give me some examples of violence that your employees have dealt with. Sure. So uh, an example is uh, an employee just simply offering service to someone, and the person will, again, turn around, physically punch them, threaten them with a knife, hit them with an object stab them with a needle. I never thought in all my years that I would have to be looking at purchasing stab vests, but that's exactly what we've had to do. That's insane in this day and age that in Canada that we're having to protect our employees like that. The attacks can happen without warning. An angry customer trying to return a product throws hot coffee at a clerk. A man stealing vitamins from a store in the heart of downtown Vancouver uses bear spray on an employee as he flees. So London Drugs is a retail powerhouse in British Columbia. I don't ever remember you or anybody from the company taking a public stance on an issue. Like, why, why this one, why now? Ian, you're exactly right, but it underscores how concerned we are about the violence against our employees and against our customers, and the fact that in the communities we serve, how many times we hear from community groups, citizens groups, that this issue isn't being addressed. To get a sense of how great the concern is, just take a look at some of the other major retailers that have joined London Drugs in a coalition called SOS, Save Our Streets, here in Vancouver and in communities across BC. But here's the problem. Even if the retailers are right that an increase in violence in stores has led to greater risk for customers and staff, what's the solution? We have to look at the root cause of these problems, Ian, and they've always been the same. It's not rocket science. We know what the issues are. Rob Danu spent years prosecuting people accused of crimes in Vancouver's downtown east side. He's now a defense lawyer in Abbotsford, an hour east of Vancouver. Well, we're looking for short-term solutions to long-term problems is the issue. So we really need to back up and once again address those basic issues. That being said, in terms of immediate responses, businesses need to be vocal. So they're doing that. They're telling their politicians that something's wrong, but not just to be vocal, but also to be vocal about what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Because when they're not telling our politicians that, look, homelessness is a problem around my business, addiction is a problem around my business, then you have politicians going on and trying to change the laws that actually don't pertain what to the actual problem is. I don't want to put everything on your shoulders, but you, you have a lot of experience, both as a former prosecutor and now as a defense lawyer. Is there a short-term or at least a medium-term solution to make things safer? There's no short-term solution to these problems, Ian. We have to dedicate significant resources and expertise to mental health, to addiction, to homelessness and poverty. So although our businesses are under stress right now, we have to take a long-term approach to this. To solve this problem, we first need to be a city that stops enabling this culture of drug addiction. But soon and Spriggs is tired of waiting for a long-term approach to make things better. Help us find these women who smashed our store window in Vancouver. She's pushing for action on social media, trying to identify people who have vandalized her business. She's the owner of City Lux Boutique in Vancouver's downtown core. So just show me the damage you've had here. Well, um, there's been multiple windows <laughs> broken, so this window out here isn't smashed, this one's been smashed, that one's been smashed. Wow. I can't remember if it was this one or this one, but one of those two is also smashed. And it's happened multiple times, so some of them have been replaced multiple times. 
Um, I guess kind of lost track. How much does it cost to fix one of these? Um, most like you can go from four thousand to like twenty five hundred, so it really varies depending $4, on the Four thousand dollars? Yeah, because they're I mean they're actually very durable windows. Oh my gosh. Beyond the broken windows, there have been some surreal moments at City Lux Boutique. A smashing grab right outside their door in the middle of the day. Yeah, and you took it. And this video was widely shared. That chair came from inside the store. A thief picked it up, carried it out, before police picked them up a few blocks away. Sprig says the big problem is addiction, and she believes not enough is being done to get people off drugs. In the meantime, her frustration grows. What does it feel like to walk in here in the morning and see that window smashed? It honestly, it, it feels like you got punched in the face or punched in the stomach. Even though it's not a personal attack, it feels like a personal attack because this is your business, this is your baby. You're the one at the end of the day who's having to come out of their pocket to repair it. It feels like the same if somebody came to your house and you came home and it was vandalized. Yeah. Um, it's personal, you know, it feels personal. Yeah. It's been almost two months since the big retailers went public with their concerns. London Drug says at its locations in Western Canada, this year alone, loss prevention officers have made 1,500 arrests. So you've been with this company for almost 40 years? Yes. Have you ever seen anything like what we're seeing now? No, it's never been like this before. And it's the level of violence and what we hear people say that there's, there's absolutely no consequences for the level of violence or theft, mm -hmm. and that's why they continue to commit these crimes. And that's scary because that means that the chances are very high they're gonna continue to commit those crimes. The proposals currently on the table to address mental health, addictions, and public safety issues in Nanaimo do not even scratch the surface, and we demand Action. Community groups and politicians in BC have railed against what they call catch and release, arresting a small number of repeat offenders only to see them quickly end up back on the street. But Rob Danu, the former prosecutor, says longer jail terms are not the answer. You know, some people are pointing out now that when uh, what appears to be a crime is committed, whether it's a window being broken or a store employee being assaulted, that the system should be tougher, that those people should go to jail, they should be punished and not just let back out on the street. Well, look, I started my career out as a Crown Prosecutor and I had that exact same view. It was a very black and white view of how the world and the law works. When I would ask for offenders to be sent to jail, they'd come back even worse. And then I asked for a longer sentence, and they'd come back even worse than that. And I learned, and the reason I moved over to a defense practice was that they needed treatment, they needed help. Again, the key question, if the level of violence is unprecedented and unacceptable, is anything going to change? We wanted to ask BC's Minister of Public Safety, Mike Farnworth, his reaction to the coalition's concerns, but his office said he wouldn't do an interview. It did send us a statement that cited the province's Safer Communities Action Plan, adding it's starting to show progress on these complex public issues, though there's no detail on what's being done to try to reduce mayhem in stores. Coming up, we're going to drill down on some possible solutions to this problem. We'll bring in two experts, a criminologist and a police chief. That's next on The Breakdown. Retail vandalism and violence caught on camera across the country. Attacks on frontline workers on the rise. According to the Retail Council of Canada, after the start of the pandemic, increasing up to 200%. But it's hard to fight it without knowing what's fueling it. Well, let's bring in a couple of people who pay a lot of attention to this topic of crime. Michael Kempa is an associate professor of criminology at the University of Ottawa. And Danny Smythe is the chief of the Winnipeg Police Service and the president of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police. Professor Kempa, our story tonight focused primarily on British Columbia, but, but what do we know about, about crime and retail outlets across Canada? Well, one thing we know is that overall shoplifting rates don't change very much from year to year or even decade to decade. Now, obviously, not all of these incidents are reported, but we also know from industry statistics that the total amount, the dollar value of loss has been going up, and the total amount of violence in these types of robberies has been increasing. 
So that tells us that the nature of shoplifting, the nature of theft in the retail workplace is changing. There's two major new uh, forms. One is being driven, such as in the segment we saw from you, along the lines of drug addiction and mental health issues and poverty driving people to deal and sometimes engage in random violence. And the other is far more organized, organized crime getting involved in systematic robberies of retail outlets to sell these things on the massively expanded markets of the internet that blew up over the course of the pandemic. And Chief Smythe, let's get the police perspective. Uh, what would you say about crime in, in retail outlets? Well, I sort of can concur with, with what uh, the professor said there. You know, that's exactly what we're seeing. Of course, your segment kind of focused in on people with addiction and, and people in crisis, but we are seeing an awful lot of what I would call more sophisticated and organized uh, shoplifting as well. You know, we had an example just here locally last week where we, we caught a guy, 17 different thefts that were captured and, and he'd been released each time and was back in the retail store doing doing the same thing. And to uh, to illustrate, he was selling, uh, reselling the stuff online. So we're, we're seeing elements of both. Uh, Chief, in 2020, as I understand it, your province, Manitoba, created a task force to deal with, with retail crimes. Has it had an impact? I think it has in some sectors. So one of the issues we were dealing with back then was prolific uh, stealing that was going on in our liquor stores. And, uh, you know, we had worked with, with uh, the retailer there. They actually changed the way they uh, sell their, their, their retail model where people are actually uh, providing their ID coming into the store. It, it all almost eliminated theft completely. But I also recognize that not every retailer can take a, an approach like that. So trying to deal or partner with the uh, Retail uh, Council of Canada to try some different initiatives. And, you know, I see agencies across the country trying to do some real targeted uh, enforcement along with some public awareness. Okay, I'll come back to that. We have, uh, you know, a big question here for both of you and not a lot of time, but Professor Kempa, I think one of the frustrating things for retailers, certainly in my experience, is hearing there is no short-term solution. There is no medium-term solution. They're saying, look, we're, we're concerned about the violence in our stores. So from a criminologist's perspective, give me an example or two of what should change that could reduce this problem. Well, I think... The, the biggest challenge is, of course, businesses have a responsibility to ensure the safety of their workers. The easiest thing for them to do, therefore, and the cheapest thing is to say, if you see theft, do nothing, because that takes you out of the possible way of harm. But then we're also creating an environment where there seems to be no repercussions and very little chance of being caught or punished or even really followed up with any type of authority. I think what we're talking about mostly is using technology to identify those prolific offenders and track what's being stolen to figure out who the broader networks are. Sometimes we're talking about local gangs. Sometimes we're talking about very sophisticated international syndicates and how they're moving these items for sale onto the Internet. I think that's really where you need to go because it's not just about catching one or two offenders red-handed or putting a couple of people in jail. It's really about trying to dry up those markets for illegal goods off of the Internet. Uh, Chief Smythe, uh, you know, with London Drugs, they took us into a room in one of their stores, and they have incredibly sophisticated video equipment there. They do track people who are stealing, taking a page out of Professor Kemp's book. Uh, they do go to the police, uh, and, and they feel good about their relationship with the police, but they are frustrated, I think, by the number of offenders who end up very quickly back on the street. Uh, as, as the chief of the Winnipeg Police Force uh, Service, what's your perspective on that? Well, we're certainly partnering with many of the retailers here locally. There, there is an element of what uh, Professor Kemp is talking about there. But I think we need to actually come to the aid of this, the retailers as well. They're, they're often the economic engine in many of our cities. They're looking for some assistance. I think our prosecutors do a pretty good job at diverting uh, offenders when it's appropriate to do so. But in some instances, people really do need to be taken out of circulation so that they can't continue to harm a community. Uh, 
particularly when there's violence involved in some of these deaths. Well, we know there's a problem and we know we need solutions and maybe this conversation is helping us towards that. Uh, thanks to both of you, Michael Kempa, Associate Professor of Criminology at the University of Ottawa, and Danny Smythe he is the Chief of the Winnipeg Police Service and the President of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And we will continue to follow the increase in retail violence. We'd like to hear your stories. You can send them to The National at cbc.ca. And this weekend on The National, we take on another shift in Canadian commerce, the rising trend of tipping. And no huge surprise here, mere mention of it brings up some strong feelings. How do you feel about tipping culture? I'm iffy about it, I'm not going to lie. I, I'm broke. It, everything is tipping now, it's just too excessive. You can't afford to eat out so much anymore. What do you think about tipping? <sighs> oh God, the customer should not bear the burden of it. I feel like it's the right thing to do. But where do you draw the line? Oh, like if I go to a coffee spot and they in the little button say tip, nah, like okay, I, I, I probably won't tip you, I'm not going to lie. If you give me good service, 100%, I'm going to tip. What do we think of tipping? Well, I am a server. <laughs> I think that tipping shouldn't be a thing, but servers need to get paid a livable wage. What do you think the like logical fix for it is, though? Increase the prices of their menu and pay their servers a livable wage. I think raising the wage definitely is needed. The fix, I've never even thought of that. I mean, a cap? <laughs> <laughs> Tipflation, tip creep, we'll get into all of that on Sunday. Coming up, a mini Christmas village with big wow factor. My ultimate dream to build one, and out of love and passion for Christmas. After more than a decade of collecting, his Christmas dream is on display in our moment. Well, this is a miniature Christmas village. You might be familiar with them. Sometimes they feature a few storefronts with lights and figurines. But this one, this is an elaborate labor of love. Edmonton's Alberto Esguera has been collecting the pieces for the past 13 years. He spent five months building it with his family. And his holiday passion is our moment. It's my dream. It's my ultimate dream. Since I was a kid, whenever we put up a Christmas tree, I try to make some uh, small Christmas houses underneath a Christmas tree. And then when I came here in Canada, uh, 13 years ago I started collecting. I have more than 100 buildings. And then people, I don't know, they're like mushrooms. <laughs> they propagate quickly. I think there are maybe around 600 of them. This is the first time I set them all together. It takes a lot of passion, patience, patience, and patience. I would say uh, five months, an hour or two a day, and some full day on my days off. Uh, back home, uh, we really love Christmas in the Philippines. Anything is family togetherness, and uh, the memory that it brings is the real meaning of Christmas. I'm going to admit it, I love Christmas villages. I have a far more modest one in my house. He has a two-bedroom apartment. His wife apparently is already saying to him, is it possible that maybe we could dismantle all of that by February? He says there's a possibility, from what I understand, that it could stay up all year, but it is beautiful. That is The National for December 15th. I hope you join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network. Our question, have tipping expectations in Canada gone too far? And later, Sunday night, I'll be back here for The National. Have a great Saturday.